So um, we will we'll start now. So welcome everybody. Um, we're starting one more round table of the uh, SCO-based committee. And uh, today we are gonna be talking about avoiding complications and particularly vascular complications. So <clears throat> in order to uh, explore some of the um, complications, of course, we will need to share some of our complications and, uh, and, and discuss how can we do different and things that we, we must do to avoid these uh, drastic and uh, catastrophic complications, which is the fear of everyone starting, particularly with uh, endoscopic and onasoscope base. And we, will, we may discuss some of the open uh, situations as well. It's not that we only have uh, vascular complications with uh, endonasal, also with open approaches. So uh, in order uh, to start here, uh, we, uh, we we would like to start. Uh, Sadir, do you have any uh, yeah. any word to share? I have an open case. I can start with that. Okay, go ahead, Sadir. I will just share my screen. Not yet. So I had this uh, case of a medial sphenoid vein meningioma a couple of weeks back, <laughs> and uh, she was a. 36 years old lady and who was having some comorbidities in form of hypothyroidism. And she had this uh, problem of headache, progressive headache, and of decreased vision in the right eye since six weeks. Uh, physical examination was not substantive. Some papilledema was there and some scotoma in the right side was there. So these were the preoperative MRIs. So you have a medial sphenoidic meningioma, which is, uh, you can see it is quite going medially and it is going into the supracellar cistern and you can see the MCA branches. ACA was uh, further down, so that was there. Again, some uh, pictures, sharing some pictures, you can see this uh, MCA branches which are going through this. Uh, now, this is a video of the same preoperative MRI. So what you can see is that as we take free, uh, uh, sections above, the branches are well inside there and the thalmostriate perforators are arising within the uh, tumor itself. Again, a coronal section. And the size was around six centimeters and uh, there were a lot of uh, branches which were there and you can see that the area which it involved and it was taking it was all these striate, lenticular striate arteries. And uh, patient was otherwise functionally preserved except for the scotoma which is there. And you can see the various branches inside the MRI scans which were there. So we admitted her, it's just uh, in February itself. And we did the case, we did a first MCA, STMCA bypass. And uh, subsequently we couldn't remove everything because we found that MCA was branching inside and there were multiple perforators. So I had to stop at this place, somewhere at this place. So this much amount of tumor had to be left behind. Uh, this is the post-op. CT scan the next day. We did an intro. We have an intro MRI, so we did that. So intro MRI, we found there was a amount of uh, infarct, which still happened despite our bypass and everything which we did for the patient. So there was an area of uh, infarct which was there. So this is uh, something which is there. Means I could have dissected the tumor less, but I wanted to remove as much as possible. But still, I got. The was well preserved. She had no weakness. She could be discharged on the fifth day after the surgery, and she is doing quite well. So this is one of the vascular complications which I've faced in the last four weeks, and uh, this is what happened. So any other takes when something yeah. else could have been? So dear, before I I ask anybody else, uh, what's in your mind? Like, uh, is there anything else different that that you think it could have done, or or you you think? So really this the question I wanted to discuss. This was 
whether we should when we are dissecting it see like we do a stmc a bypass for a moya moya disease at that time we we see that the perfor the perforators thalmocyte perforators do get supply later on from there so but that is not in acute setting in this acute setting what has happened is that uh, in this the perforators the blood supply of the perforators couldn't be taken by this thing and i think if inside the tumor it is we have to limit ourselves we shouldn't go very aggressively where the perforators are there so that's what my learning was there from this case that's what i said but any comments or we could have done differently somebody can tell us so i'm i'm curious to see what uh, walter uh, what, what normally you do in this case is um, any any different uh, perspective from the netherlands um well, we wouldn't do the bypass. Uh, we don't have a lot of experience with that. Um, uh, so so uh, to start with, you call it a, a medial sinoid wing meningioma. I call it an, an anterior clinoid sinoid uh, yeah, meningioma. And, and the difference is for me, it's the encasement of the carotid. And once the carotid is encased, the risks go up significantly, right? And so, so then uh, <clears throat> you start worrying, okay, do we actually need to do surgery? Can we do radiation? Is that easier? Uh, we would probably have started the same, doing without the bypass, do the surgery. And if it's a if it's a firm tumor, it's it's non-dissectable. We will leave remnants uh, around the uh, around the arteries and just watch that. And if that grows again, then radiate. So not much different, but just uh, yeah, I think it's a, a medial clinoid or an anterior clinoid is a is a different animal and it's a it's a risky operation. Yeah, I, I I would share the same thoughts. I I wouldn't do the uh, bypass on these cases. Try to uh, go all the way, open the cerium fissure distally, find the uh, the MCA, follow it back, and then all those perforators. If the tumor is very firm, then they just stays there exactly like you did, Sadir. So like you try to remove those uh, part around the perforators is an issue. I, I'm curious to see uh, Omar in in Boston there. Like I don't know uh, if you have a different style in these cases. Yeah, no, I mean, I agree with, with both those comments. It's an inherently difficult operation. The clinodal aspect makes it makes it intrinsically difficult. I also agree with the comment about a bypass. Um, you know, we, our institution does a fair number of bypasses for vascular indications, but not for tumor indications. So I don't think I would have done that here. I think I would have done the same thing, which is trying to leave a little bit on the mesial side of the perforators and, and watch it. But, um, you know, yeah, in order to case. go through more cases, uh, I just ask the panel, like anyone has a different uh, perspective, like we have done anything different. I just, you know, I think we all talked about the bypass. And my question is that carotid is wide open with the patient ischemic before presenting with TIAs or ischemic manifestations. And if not, then that carotid is wide open. When you bypass, you create com competing flow. To that open carotid unless you bypass and ligate and did the tumor at the same time so that competing flow can cause ischemia by itself so that might explain some of the ischemic uh, events that happened but in the long term when the tumor grows out even if you do radiotherapy there will be some swelling which sets in and that may compromise later on this vascular flow i so don't I disagree think it was that yeah yeah just you know the timing and that window of two competing flows with your graft and the carotid, one of them might might override the other. And if the carotid is wide open, then your bypass might not work. <clears throat> yeah. yeah okay. Well, um, these are challenges. So there is hard to really say there's a solution for this. I think we all agree that uh, what happened to this patient is uh, something can happen on anyone's hands. Yeah even trying everything to avoid, so not, not easy. Um, so let's move to Francesco. Um, uh, do you want to share your screen, Francesco, and uh, yep, tell us about sure. what happened to you in your unfortunate situation and see what we can uh, discuss? Yes. <clears throat> so can you see my screen now? Yeah. OK. So great. Oh, let me just do. Okay, so I will. I thought I would uh, briefly discuss this case. I have no relevant dis disclaimer, really. This is uh, the case of a 38 year old woman with a long history. As you can see, she was operated on for the first time 
when 27 <clears throat> for Cushing disease. And she underwent radiation treatment with video surgery two years later. And then for the severity of the disease, she even underwent a bilateral partial adrenalectomy. And in 2016, so four years after radiation treatment, she had uh, what was described as a partial apoplexy, which was in the right cavernous sinus and was um, uh, conservatively treated. Uh, in March 2021, this was the neuroradiological picture. So as you can see, possibly a small remnant in the right cavernous sinus, but otherwise I would say even a partial empty cell. So unfortunately I see her in September, 2021, when she presents with uh, uh, cavernous sinus syndrome involving the third cranial nerve and even the trigeminal nerve. And as you could see on the MRI, it was this large tumor involving the cellar, supracellar and paracellar area. And there was uh, this uh, small portion that was outside the cavernous sinus along the third, which was uh, partially apoplectic. So that's why it wasn't picking up contrast here. Um, so we discussed this in our board and we opted for a plan of surgery and re-irradiation. I was worried about this component. So I spoke to the uh, center in Pavia, which is one of the few centers in Italy that do proton beam. And we discussed sacrificing the right ICA as it had been previously irradiated, but they were confident they could re-irradiate with no ICA sacrifice. So um, really briefly, this is the scenario after uh, cellular, supracellular, <clears throat> and clival component <clears throat> debulking. And uh, as you can see, right from the start, the right ICA was a little bit more white than, than usual. But this is when I uh, told my anesthesiologist that I would start working in the cavernous sinus. As you can see, the tumor was relatively suckable. Again, this is the ICA. This is tumor in the anterior inferior compartment, but I was worried about the posterior superior compartment. I just wanted to get tumor away from the brain. And this is what I got. So if I can show you just once again, I was using uh, the angled suction, but I wasn't sucking on the carotid. And this is the rupture uh, we got. So uh, immediately the whole team was alerted and uh, we just, uh, first of all, packed. And fortunately enough, the abdomen was ready. So uh, I asked my assistants to harvest uh, muscle as well as fat, which, uh, and the muscle, I, I must say, I was really impressed, worked uh, really nicely. So this is the piece of muscle that I positioned there for around two minutes. And then the reconstruction was uh, finished as planned with the fat and the uh, nasal septal flap. Obviously at this point, actually before this, the anterior sweep uh, was cold. We covered up everything with a flap and we took the uh, patient to uh, the anterior sweep. And I would say we were uh, fortunate enough uh, because she, well, first of all, we couldn't see any pseudo aneurysm. But that, as you could see, the carotid was obviously pathological, it was fairly unchanged as compared to the pre-op MRI. And again, fortunately enough, she passed nicely the test. And we, I opted for occlusion of the carotid because I knew I had left a tumor uh, behind. And I thought I wanted to go transcranially to uh, further debug the tumor. Again, fortunately enough, the patient was uh, unchanged neurologically after the first surgery. But unfortunately, the histology documented a sarcoma, um, 
highly aggressive, undifferentiated. We were not able to further define it. And um, the whole story continues with a transcranial approach, but even the subarachnoid portion of the tumor was really stuck to everything. And she then went to radiation and chemo, but unfortunately passed away 11 months later. And with this, I'm finished. Yeah, could you want to share the screen there? Uh, yes. So, so the uh, this shows, I think, uh, one aspect that is very important is the fact that patients that receive radiation to the carotid, carotid is a uh, human and a live tissue, and radiation causes that tissue to be definitely very friable. Uh, you see, when the little massage with a very blunt suction caused that, I can I can also share a. Um, in this line, if you don't mind, I share now just because in line with the same um, one situation that we had here, uh, very, if you can see there, uh, this also, this just very short, this patient had uh, uh, also radiation three times. This is a chordoma. And uh, I was working with Ricky Corral here and just exactly the same with the blunt instrument, just kind of trying to, go behind the carotid because the patient had a new third nerve palsy with recurrence. And we're just massaging that, that chordoma that was around the carotid and just with the, with the blunt dissector there, uh, pop it the, pop the, uh, the, um, the carotid because, you know, it's, you don't need anything. It's very important. I think everybody listening to this uh, later understand that radiation causes this tissue to be extremely friable. A, a, a healthy carotid artery wouldn't have this outcome here. Um, in this case, we did exactly the same. Uh, uh, we, we sacrificed the carotid artery with coils and we went back actually. See, you see coils is travasating. This is the second surgery several days later. Uh, we were able to then debulk the tumor, uh, but we had to sacrifice the carotid with coils. So well, um, I'll just move on here, like stop sharing, just just to since it's in line with the same with the same type of conclusion, <clears throat> and I thought that's uh, that's important. Uh, Dusik, what do you think? Hello, I I have a, a very similar uh, experience of uh, the ICA injuries during the Indonesia approaches, and the vascular injuries can be divided into the uh, the spinal stages when you use the drills we can encounter the vascular injury. And also when we removed, approach the tumors, we can experience the IC injuries. And I'm gonna share my experience. Can I can I share the, the, yeah. the monitor? Go ahead. I uh, recently, I presented the complications of avoidance of the face crane injury for during the endoscopy scurvy surgery and I skip. And when we do uh, drill the at the spin of the stages, and sometimes we can encounter the, some bleedings and and then we need to the control the with the assistance of the my the faculty members and we need the large bore suctions and finally so we can control just compressed with the cotinoid and then the most cases, and I found that we have to the, trap the ICA. This was the, my colleague's case, and he controlled the bleedings from the dural margin. And then after removal of the cr cranial pharyngiomas, and he experienced the, successfully removed the tumor. At the final stages, he found that some bleedings from the ICA. And unfortunately, this patient was expired. And also another time is uh, uh, anterior uh, AC injuries during the tumor removals. I just uh, opened the dural. I found that some tumors sunken down because of the gravity of the tumor with the CSF efflux. And then it's funny. So I just op the observed, the, but the tumor was sunken down. This case was the giant pituitary adenoma. And then uh, mm -hmm. some I found that some apoplectic the tumor tissues and I traced the bleeding focus. And then finally, I found there's some injury of the, the ACA injury cases. 
and then we try to the clip, but it's not successful. So we open the uh, open craniotomy, and my colleagues, and then I trapped the proximal ICA, ACA, and he found that left uh, distal A1 injury, and we successfully clipped that one. It was very the lucky cases, but sometimes we we may experience the pico matri injuries during the cutting the tumor captures. It's the it's a very similar case of the radiation history and then previous cases. And but we I uh, I did I sacrificed the pico matri aneurysms and I skip. It's very common. Uh, happens the ICA injuries during the tumor biopsies and previous history of the radiations and then after the operations and we control the breathings but uh, we the should I experience the pseudo aneurysms but we placed the craft the stand and successfully the uh, uh, we kept the patent of the ICA but uh, I would like to show that this is, was the very as my unlucky cases. I experienced of the, the dural sp spaces. I just only opened the dural, and then you see, I, the tumor was very hard. And then it's very the similar cases with the, the Danny, and you can see the, some bleedings from the ICA. At the times I didn't recognize the bleedings origin was from the ICA. So at the time I compressed and then I used the, the flow seal and maybe five milliliter injection of the, the flow seal. I successfully controlled the bleeding, but um, my, the, uh, the other member noticed me, the uh, uh, somatosensory EP and MEP was disappeared. After operations, you see. This was the ECA. This was the ICA. I found that there was no ICA. You can see the CT scans shows the diffused uh, embolic infarct because caused by the flow series. From the ICA, the flow series profused the distribute to the left side uh, hemispheres. It was a very fatal experience. So uh, thereafter, I didn't look, uh, the, use the flow shears uh, at the, the interdural stages. The patient was a very unlucky cases. So quick question, Adusik. For this case, when you got that uh, bisector, that, was this a radiated uh, carotid or this was a healthy carotid? Uh, healthy, healthy carotid. Man, this is the uh, scary case. Yeah. It was very scary. Oh, wow. Um, and I see you did a decompression oh. there as well. Huh? Yeah. Just the only opening of the ICA, we we, uh, we could uh, the trap the ICA or bypass, but at the times, I just used the, the flow series. It was a big mistake for me. And so I didn't recognize the, the dangerous use of the uh, flow series. Yeah, it yeah. works very well for venous, yeah. but once it's arterial, we have to, uh, you know, this is a major lesson for all of us. It, it has to be really like uh, be used carefully. I'll, I'll, I'll let Fran Francisco uh, discuss. I think he's waiting for talk. Yeah. Go ahead. Hello, my friends. I have, I have, a, I had an experience. I have one question first for Francesco. Do you think, do you think maybe this sarcoma was radioinduced? Yeah, that's one of the yes, we think so. Okay, yeah, me too. Is my appreciation. Okay, you know, I I, I was wrong in the preoperative diagnosis. There, I thought it was Nelson syndrome, but I should have looked. Well, I should have thought better because in March, everything was clean. Normal. And then mm. in, less than six months later, this huge tumor comes up. And yeah. then I think the, the other teaching point, it was an irradiated carotid. I was there 
I was telling my coworker, oh, this karate looks funny, but I had never experienced, you know, an ICA rupture just by bluntly touching it. And so that's why I wanted to, to share the case. Yeah, but I, I, I was... Really I was wondering the same because because you show us a, an almost normal cavernous sinus picture and six months later you have a huge tumor. You have to think it's something malignant. It's not common, not even a meningioma, not even a adenomas to increase that much in, in six months. Uh, I don't have pictures here or videos, but I have a I had a case that I want to share at least orally with you. Uh, mm -hmm. I have a rupture with a Many Joma doing endoscope, uh, the carotid rupture, that just the same lab like you. Uh, we place muscle, we place uh, after muscle surgery cell, we, we pack it. Very good. And after that, we go to the angiogram suite. And we have a large discussion because when we did the angiogram, looks normal almost normal. I mean, like packing was like really good packing. And before that, we usually uh, sacrifice the carotid, but we try to make something different and we place a flow diverser where we don't sacrifice the carotid and the patient, the patient did well. Uh, yeah, I don't know if it's the same rule to do with all the patient, but of course, once you place a diverser, you had to follow up, but it's a it's a was a good experience because we didn't we didn't have to sacrifice the carotid. You know that sometimes if you sacrifice the carotid, you have an infarct. So, so yeah. I want to share so, that with you. Yeah, so, so, Danny, I have something to echo Francesco's uh, discussion. The case I I can show and please go ahead. It, it's too more complicated than what uh, it's a little different. Let me. It's about the stents um oh yeah go ahead all right so this is a simple case that went complicated um 66 years old with right visual problems you know confirmed by ophthalmology exam and if you see the films here there is like the tumor is in the mid medial optic canal and small tumor, all medial, perfect for endoscopic endonasal. And we were done with the tumor, but this dura here is what's going medially in the optic canal and it's all involved by tumor. And I think that kerosene should never be used there. So I thought that we are away from the carotid and we got that happen. It looked like, like that, as you see, it's jet stream from I didn't know. I mean, the carotid was supposed to be more posterior, but obviously it's something fishy there. So packing, I can't see the defect. I like, could not see the defect where it's coming from. So packing immediately and move to NG suite. We were able to put three or four half by six cottonoids. And the problem is now you're intradural. So the difference here is not cavernous. You're intradural, your your crinoidal segment. So you don't have you don't have reconstruction of the skull base. It's a defect into the nose. So so you're taking emergently to the IR, and you see the angio you hear. Like Francesco was saying, you know the carotid looks normal. I was, I thought that we lost the ophthalmic, but the ophthalmic, as you see, is wide open. There is no. I mean, my colleague, the vascular. Uh, neurosurgeon said that there is no pseudo aneurysm. You can see an indentation here from the packing, but pretty much we were like, maybe it's a dural branch, maybe it's something, you know, like perforate. I mean, something is not the main carotid. So we let her wake up and she was completely fine. Her vision was better to be taken back um, to the angio suite for removal of the packing three days later. Did the angio suite. So we did that in the angio suite, the biplanner. So we had the endoscopic setup in the in the NG suite, which was a little bit of um, improvising. And we were ready with like removal of the packing and have a balloon in the carotid, muscle graft, cover the stent, and nasoceptal flap. That was our plan. So here is the, just to show 
how we did that. It is the uh, biplanar energy suite. This is one, this is the other, and uh, the endoscopic tower, um, and you monitor here. So we're standing on one side and we had the IR table, the OR table, and all the equipments in the energy suite. So that's a little difficult because they don't like to do it in the hybrid room because it's not biplanar. So that's something, you know, that we had to improvise and do so. When we were removing the packing, we got the bleeding again. So they inflated the balloon and we put muscle graft and packed again. And they tried the cover distent. So something to say about the cover distent, it's off-label use intracranially. So that didn't work. And um, when, when we looked at the angio again, there is no like vascular injury. So the cover distent could not work. So we kept the packing in place. And unfortunately, after they attempted uh, cover distent, you see this embolic, embolic strokes. So that was not successful. So plan B was to put the pipeline stents and we put triple uh, pipeline and dual antiplatelets, kept the packing in place. Now we have an intradural packing, just to remind everybody. And she went back to the NG suite for multiple attempts for the visospasm because she was developing visospasm. And now we had a pseudoaneurysm. So I think when we inflated the balloon, we made the defect bigger. And now you have a pseudoaneurysm and you can see our packing here. And that's the pseudoaneurysm there. So the problem now that you have a pseudoaneurysm that's like blister aneurysm, you can't remove the packing. The pipeline has to stay in place for three months for that aneurysm to heal. And you know, anti, the dual antiplatelets. So now we're racing against the time to get rid of the packing, to reconstruct the skull base and to avoid the meningitis problem, and also the pseudoaneurysm not to bleed again while we're doing that. So, so we waited on her two weeks, lumbar drain in place, and luckily no infection. Um, we had to stop one of the dual antiplatelets, keep her only on aspirin to make that pseudoaneurysm coagulate or uh, thrombose more, and when we had the stasis in the aneurysm, we took her back and we got the idea that we have to tamponade this pseudo aneurysm with something from the outside. And that would be a big chunk of muscle. So instead of lugging the skull base defect with fat, we're gonna put a big chunk of muscle from the thigh and on top of that fat and nasoceptal flap. So that actually went like magic. Once I snugged that, fat, as that muscle graft, the pseudoaneurysm disappeared immediately. And you see the carotid. Oh, by the way, this is isolated hemisphere, so you cannot really sacrifice the carotid. That's why we were really stuck with that option. So you see, pseudoaneurysm disappeared immediately. So we were able to do the muscle fat, nasoceptal uh, flap, and she took some time to recover, like from the right hemiparesis from this embolic stroke. So. The problem was intradural arterial injury that you have a skull base defect connected with the CSF. You have to pack the muscle would not work if you don't see the defect there. The risk of CSF leak, the pipeline does not short term so, uh, like solve the pseudoaneurysm problem. So you still have to deal with that. And that would be with the muscle graft like we did from the outside. That's what made the, the aneurysm, the pseudoaneurysm disappear. So that's how we handle this case. I would uh, stop yeah. sharing. Yeah, so, so uh, Sami, I, I would like to just uh, make a summary of the, in my mind, the three flavors of, uh, of solutions, ways to kind of solve, like they're in, 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 I think there are only three options. One is when you have a small hole, like Francesco uh, showed in his, I have one like that as well, near the, near in a tuberculum cell meningioma. Muscle only in multiple uh, angiograms proving that there's no pseudoaneurysm. I think in your case, didn't you have a pseudoaneurysm initially. If you had muscle there uh, and perhaps waiting a little longer, possibly would have solved that. Possibly. I don't know. Yeah, I couldn't put the muscle there because I, I couldn't see anything to put the All muscle. Right. That's one of the problems. I had that yeah. problem. The flow was so high. 
and you, you put the muscle, you don't even know if the muscle is in place or not. So I agree with that problem. But if the muscle is, if we can put the muscle and weight and do multiple angiograms and no pseudoaneurysm, I'll tell you the one I had, I repeated in the three days, seven days, and then two weeks. I did it in one month. I did it in three months. And then at six months, I started doing CTAs. And that was just muscle only. Yeah. And the second version is when you have your muscle there uh, and then you do an angel and you have pseudoaneurysm, which is kind of where your case went through. I think there is a possibility in those cases, if you can put cover stent, I guess an option, but I, I, it's not you that have had complications. Those are very rigid stents. And exactly. yeah. there's several descriptions in the literature of uh, cover stents destroying the carotid and exploding at the petrous level. And there's a disasters there. So the way I see is two or three pipelines. Each pipeline stent covers around 30% of the surface. So if you have two or three there, you actually have most of the wall covered. That only works if you have muscle on the other side. So stent and muscle, and, yep. and you have to anticoagulate this case patients because of the stent with a Plavex, as you pointed out. And then you have the third version, which is when there's nothing you can do, you can try stents, but, but the, the, the destruction of the vessel is so large, which is the cases we saw earlier, where the carotid exploded and, and was previously radiated. You try to pass the stent, opens more, patient sanguinated in the angel suite and, and you have to sacrifice. Those are then, so that's the third version that I see where you have to go ahead and sacrifice. There's nothing else you can do. And the problem is sacrification. You do need to have coils on top and below, uh, or if you can have direct access to clip. But, but if you're doing the angel suite, you also need to go from the other side and coil the, uh, the uh, distal portion of the vessel. So I think that, that that kind of summarizes in terms of in my mind. I don't know if anybody has another flavor of possibility there. I'll let David talk. But I was going to bypass that if yeah. nothing worked because it's isolated hemisphere. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah that would be then that, that what to do next if, when you yeah. don't have another option. David. Yeah, I think there's one flavor that might be available to us uh, in outside of the U.S., which is the use of balloons, de uh, de uh, deployable balloons which I don't think uh, is FDA approved um, and therefore not, not available to you. Um, I've, got, I've actually got an instance where, which I can share with you uh, as a balloon is deployed to cover that exact please problem. Do, please do, yeah, that, that's different. Would Let's you, see. Would you like to see it? Please, yeah. Okay, I'm just gonna share my screen. Yeah, the balloons for some reason got taken out of practice in the US. Hmm. I just need to quickly grant access. Um, would somebody like to continue while I grant access? Uh, it seems like I have to slow down for a second here. Maybe Suishi, do you have anything? Um, I know you had something. Okay. okay uh, my talk is uh, uh, totally different. Uh, you share us. <laughs> For me, uh, they are suffocating, you know, their complications of the mind is our mind is kind of a kindergarten one. You see my screen? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, I want to uh, discuss vascular complications, especially uh, focusing on the uh, uh, half radar injury and uh, uh, venous injury. And uh, uh, in my opinion, um, uh, among scar-based meningiomas, uh, there are two types of meningiomas that are considered to be at high risk. Uh, one is the anterior crinoid, and although it's rare, the posterior crinoid meningiomas. And uh, uh, in this presentation, I want to discuss our, our recent case. So this 53-year-old lady uh, presented with a chief complaint of a rapid reversing of a left side vision over the last one week. And the MR showed uh, this tumor. And as you see here, uh, as you see uh, the location of the ICA, uh, which has been pushed uh, from uh, posterior, I think uh, this is the uh, posterior crinoid meningioma. And uh, this is a preoperative angiography. So the angiography showed the presence of feeding arteries from the ICA and the narrowing the ICA due to strong compression. 
some surgeons have suggested that total resection should be avoided because of the very high risk of vascular complications in such tumors. Also, uh, from PCOM, there was a partial feeding to the tumor. So for this tumor, uh, we developed the following treatment plans. First, uh, due to our tight surgical schedule at the time, uh, we could not perform the several hour surgery within a few days. Therefore, uh, we first decided to perform a short surgery for uh, optic nerve decompression via arterial approach. And as for the second surgery, um, we plan to add a partial transpetrosal approach and remove the tumor uh, from both the posterior and the anterior approach of the tumor. So you see here, I'm gonna skip this part and uh, well, let me see. Uh, having the direct exposure of the optic nerve, I drew the uh, optic uh, nerve, uh, optic nerve roof, optic nerve roof. and then removing the uh, eggshell uh, fragment. And uh, if you uh, look at the uh, constriction on the optic nerve, you can easily understand uh, how strong the optic nerve has been compressed in this first form ligament part. And uh, uh, unfortunately, her vision remained at two over 200, where her visual deterioration stopped. So uh, we uh, conducted, to, uh, conducted the preoperative embryization the feeders from the tentorial artery and the recurrent meningeal artery. And also the, uh, this angiogram showed the PCOM running inside the tumor. And the, also the anterior choroidal artery was uh, running like this. So the second surgery, uh, this was done via uh, left side, uh, partial petrosectomy. This is a transverse sinus and the sigmoidal sinus. And now I'm uh, exposing the uh, uh, sigmoid sinus and during the uh, petrous apex, this is the middle meningeal. And this is the GSPN. And by doing this, uh, I could expose the uh, pre-sigmoid dura and uh, I could get, get the uh, posterior exposure of the tumor. And to avoid the uh, venous injury for this type of surgery, uh, we need to preserve the uh, uh, venous reflex from the posterior fossa via the uh, petrous vein here. You see, this is the petrous, superior petrous vein flowing into the uh, superior SPS, superior uh, petrous uh, sinus. And uh, uh, by doing this, uh, I could directly you know, confirm the location of the convergence, conference of the uh, pictures of vein and the SPS. And uh, I could cut the SPS uh, just in front of the, uh, the conference so that I could preserve the venous reflex from the posterior fossa to the superior pictures of sinus. Another good thing of this approach is that you could uh, get a good exposure of the posterior part of the tumor. You see, this is the fourth nerve and the SCA. So to safely remove this type of tumor, you know, it's always good to have our, our, a healthy nerve and healthy, you know, the arteries behind the tumor. This is the vascular trunk. Now I could forward the vascular trunk. This is a contralateral acromotor nerve. And also um, I could have a direct exposure of the perforators from the anterior caudal artery to the cerebral peduncle here. <clears throat> then now I'm following the anterior caudal artery running inside the tumor. This is a vascular trunk. So now I see the, uh, this is a P1 and the, the vasa top is here. So I should have followed uh, this artery, you know, as a guide. However, I just uh, did the internal decompression too much and I had bleeding inside the tumor and this was a PCOM running inside the tumor. 
and uh, I, I could not see any perforators from this area. However, uh, this, this was not, you know, my plan. So I need to coagulate the pecan and the, we uh, suddenly had a uh, decreased uh, amplitude of the uh, MAP, but the trunk left side P1 on the left side pecan. So I should uh, have followed this uh, angular structure. So we're, but I just continued the uh, internal decompression as much as possible. And I opened the dura, look at the anterior part of the tumor where we had touched two months ago, but uh, since uh, two months had passed, the adhesion had become stronger and more difficult to detach the tumor from the ICA. So I, I just gave up for, uh, of a further removal. So post operative MRI also uh, showed the uh, sub, uh, partial resection, like a 60%. And also the post operative MRI showed thermic infarction in the region of the pecan perforator. And uh, although she has showed a good recovery, uh, but uh, it took over a month uh, before she was uh, discharged home. So the, uh, the points of my presentation is uh, what kind of approach you use or uh, what indication for you to uh, employ the preoperative memorization and uh, what about the timing of a second surgery? Thank you very much. Thank you, Suish. I think uh, this is very in line with uh, Sadir presented earlier, right? Uh, you know, when you have right. these perforators, major vessels going through the tumor, I think in my opinion, it's easier to uh, remove a MCA out of the tumor, but the, the smaller anterior choroidal PCOM uh, is very difficult to really dissect and preserve and try to obtain a major uh, resection. I think, as uh, Deer pointed out, I think uh, we, it's probably something that we have to have in mind that these cases, even tell the patient, is unlikely going to remove everything and plan for something more conservative. Uh, what, Walter, what do you think? No, I agree. I, I was very impressed by the surgery. I think uh, you did a beautiful job. Uh, uh, really, really nice. But it's these cases are terrible. You know, this is uh, I, I tend to be a bit more conservative and, and, and do some form of radiation. I have a comment about the approach, Danny. Go ahead. Uh, so Ichi, I, I know you guys are very liberal with the three sigmoid posterior petrosectomy part, but I think what we do in our practice is what we call the PTAP, the pretemporal anterior petrosectomy, and basically it's a combined Dulenc and Kawasi. And that mm -hmm. should get you to the lower part of the tumor because your tumor was high, was not going anywhere below the tent and get you the same concept. But I know, like, especially my friend, the Sebastian Frolich, he's always called the posterior petrosectomy. It's an approach up. It's like you're going up with the, with the approach, but I think it's a lot of work for like a little gain, but other than that, I think everything you did was amazing. You know, that these are difficult cases. It's yeah. just a posterior bit it's like of part that is still like <laughs> a little Right, too... but uh, just only a minimum part, you know. Yeah, if, no, I saw that. If, you... Yeah, it, yeah, if it were you, it just take uh, 15 minutes, additional 15 minutes, I think. Uh, no, you're yeah. fast. <laughs> Omar, do you have any uh, comment, Omar? Yeah, I was going to say, I, you know, we, um, I, I do like this combined approach from anterior and posterior, and, and um, I really like the posterior petrosectomy for things, you know, like this and a, and a future cliable. I think the question I had that you brought up is the timing. You know, uh, when when I've done these, and and in general when we do these, we try to do it Monday Tuesday, so you know, one one day apart. And here, it sounds like there's some issues that caused a longer delay. Intrinsically, a very difficult surgery, of course. And, and, and it's never gonna be a complete resection for the reasons we discussed, but I wonder if a shorter interval might have allowed less adhesions to form and maybe a little bit a little bit more work to be done. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. I completely agree. Well, I would I would do uh, earlier if I had the same case. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let's, uh, so let's get David. Uh, did you solve your problem, David, to show your balloon on the carotid? And then yeah, I think so. finalize after David, I want Jun Muto to show the uh, some of the solutions and how to practice, right, Jun? So you can go after David and be, be ready. Okay, let me see if I can share this.
Okay. Uh, so what we're looking at here is the angiogram that was performed uh, after the injury. You can still see my instrument. I was too fearful to remove it, taking the patient up straight from our theater. Uh, you put in the, the, presenter, the presenter. Can you see that? Yeah, just put in the presenter so we can see full screen. Okay. Um, Uh, down to the, uh, yeah, that should work. Okay, you can see that? No, that's not full screen, is that? No, I guess I said presenter, but if you, yeah, just the regular one you're presenting, yeah. That's so right at the bottom there. Here we go, here we there go. We go. Well, we're going to have to run through this. Okay, here we go. So this is this is the patient in the angio suite. You can see there's the the carotid. There's my um, instrument maintaining pressure on the carotid. Um, and at this point, the gauze plugs are removed, and you can see the extravasation of contrast medium. So my my colleague then uh, placed what what we call a de de deployable balloon. You can just see the outline of it there. Now, I don't think this is available to, to everybody based on FDA approvals. And that allows, allows you to um, cover the, the injury site, both uh, proximal and distal. Um, and uh, that, was, that was successful. Obviously, you need to have performed a balloon occlusion test to ensure that there's sufficient uh, collateral flow, uh, which there was in this case. And uh, that's been successful. Follow-up angiograms uh, have shown that there's been no embolization or movement of that balloon. And um, uh, we did suffer some other uh, complications, and that was unfortunately through the use of flow seal, which uh, I won't I won't use again in this instance. So, so David, let me understand. So this balloon occludes the vessel. It's like a, instead of coils, it's just the balloon to to occlude it. Correct. It it occludes well, the the entire lumen. Okay. And um, it traverses the injury site. So then, okay. that used to be the the standard treatment for uh, neural, uh, uh, carotid cavernous fistula before the coil yeah. used to be the deployable balloon. But like for some reason, like you said, FDA banned it. It's not in practice in the U.S. anymore. Well, I would just I would just defend my three flavors still because I mean it is a balloon or we coil, but you're sacrificing the carotid at, at the end of the day, right? With this. Balloon or coils, uh, in terms These of uh, balloons, were known as Sabernico's balloons, and they used to the balloons used to deflate and cause embolization later on or some problems later on. That's why they got discontinued, actually. So, uh, they, they have been a like CCF, they have been a very old treatment for this thing. Initially, all endovascular started with these balloons only, actually. Yeah. So I don't know if before we go to Jumoto, Walter, do you have any case to show or Omar? Because I, 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 I have know. a I have a brief case if you want to. Yeah, I, since we start a little after the hour, why don't you go ahead and show? Sure. It's a it's a little different um, uh, point of view. Do you see the screen? Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is a seventy six year old male. He presented uh, with painful uh, loss of vision of his right eye and a six nerve palsy. And he had a history of an auto-inflammatory disease, not, not really known what it was, but he had a, a broad workup and he you know, did lumbar punctures and whatever. They, they couldn't find the cause of his issues. And so they asked us to do a biopsy. And the, the differential diagnosis at that time was lymphoma or infection. Uh, so it's the right eye. There's something going on here in the in the apex of the orbit, um, optic canal, superior orbital fissure. Uh, with contrast, it's enhancing. Uh, so it looked like okay, we should be able to to get a diagnosis there relatively easy. Um, we weren't worried about his optic nerve function at that time. He was practically blind. Uh, so we said, we're not going to solve that with this. We're just going to get a diagnosis. So we were even prepared to go into the apex of the orbit to do a biopsy. 
this is what it looked like on a, on a CT scan. Um, and this was scheduled on a, on a, like an emergency case of almost, and a, a relative junior team went in, ENT and neurosurgery. Uh, this is what they saw. They did an, an uh, endoscopic endonasal approach just through the right nostril. They didn't go by uh, lateral. Uh, and so they removed some mucosa and they already saw some tissue here. Uh, and they thought, okay, this, this could be okay to get a biopsy. So they moved some more mucosa. So this is the dura of the superior orbital fissure and the, and the uh, orbit is right here, right? Um, this is a blunt circular dissector and they were just removed. They just tried to get some tissue there with this dissector and they got a, a carotid bleed with that. Now the carotid bleed wasn't huge with, with some packing, it immediately solved. However, they didn't have a diagnosis at that time. So they were brave enough. Uh, they called me in to come and, and, and help. And they also were brave enough to do a biopsy. Uh, in hindsight, that was a foolish thing to do because they basically biops biopsied the carotid because this is actually tissue on the carotid which is uh, clearly abnormal. And then with the biopsy, um, the carotid bleed that was small, um, it just became uh, a bigger issue. Um, with packing, it was solved, but similar as it has been described by you, uh, with just some, some packing there, it was very hard to get muscle there because once you start removing the petties, you got so much blood, it's just one nostril. So it's very difficult to, to uh, manipulate. So we went into the angio suite uh, we could see that there it was packed, it was, but there was still leaking of the um, of the contrast, and we ended up having to sacrifice the carotid, as you said, both distally and proximally. We had to coil. Uh, we waited for a day uh, to settle, and then remove the um, um, the packing out of the nostrils, and uh, that worked fine. Uh, the patient needed a few days to recover. Uh, but finally recovered nicely. So what was the diagnosis? The diagnosis was uh, aspergilloma. So uh, the message here, I think, is that uh, with um, uh, aspergilloma uh, in, the, in this area, the carotid becomes friable as well. And it's a, it's a very you know, dangerous procedure yeah, very, to do a biopsy. We have one here with Rick Corral as well. It was a fungus ball under the sinus with... Uh, you could see it was some dehiscence on the CT, and just by taking some of uh, the sinus, you know, the disease, the carotid went went open as well. Yeah. Omar, do you have any case to show, or or you're okay yeah. with the discussion? Yeah, I can show just a very quick one, a, a different type of case. Um, yep. I I can try to share my screen. I think I need permission, maybe Danny. Maybe um, uh, let me see, Natalia, do you have a? Let's see here. Oh, I'm the doctor Arnaud is trying to share. Yeah. Okay, give me one quick second here. Okay. Thank you. No problem. I was gonna I was gonna share um a carotid injury. Um but I think we've had a, a very good discussion about those. Oh, I'm sorry, I think I need to set this up. Well, we can, uh, we can, uh, while you get ready, let's yeah. see, uh, June, June, do you mind sharing uh, the model? Because I think there, there are several things here. One, one of the problems we have, as you, you've seen, the flow can be tremendous when we get, uh, particularly through the nose. So June uh, created this model for practicing, for us surgeons to get there and, and try to do the best uh, in controlling the bleeding. Go ahead, June. I think it's yeah, muted. Muted, June. Hello, everybody. So I would like to share my case, but uh, my case is previously discussed. Just uh, make up a small pin hole on the uh, carotid and uh, put the cotton and muscle and uh, 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 can achieve the uh, 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 hemostasis. And uh, yeah. 
So just, yeah. So the young, young neurosurgeon tried to make a control the breathing by monopolar and make a small pinhole on the uh, carotid like this. And the uh, breathing is coming from uh, uh, harder. And uh, so the, uh, we put the cotton on the uh, aperture point. Yeah, I'd like to, uh, sorry. Okay, just just a skip quickly. Yeah. So in the end, so I can, we can control the breathing and uh, oh, make a hemostasis. Yeah. Sorry, I cannot skip the uh, case. So yeah. So in the end, we can make a like we can uh, make a hemostasis and uh, just a small indentation on the carotid like this here. And three months after, also the same. So on the 3D CTA, so every two months we can hold the uh, carotid by three, uh, three months. And uh, after the one year, also the week, uh, just a small indentation on the carotid. So like this. So this is a model we developed. So that's a uh, con connect to the pump and 100% to the artificial and. Uh, uh, just put on the lever on the surface and just uh, 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 made by 3D printer like this. So I'd like to show you the uh, video just to simulate the uh, uh, endonasal endoscopic surgery like this and make a, a exact anatomy and drill, drill, the, uh, drill by the uh, curved drill and make a, a a uh, hole uh, on the anterior wall of the spinal sinus and the, the uh, anatomy is exactly the same and uh, this is a spinal sinus also oh, here here is a carotid so we make we keep drilling and uh, this is a uh, no tube model just uh, usually the uh, uh, rupture is uh, suddenly happen that's why to keep drilling the uh, breathing is uh, occurred suddenly like this so keep the uh, View clear and make uh, use uh, a six suction and make a control of the breathing like this. But the one hundred percent of artificial. That's why so we cannot make a, a hemostasis. Just control and practice for younger surgeon. So use the goals uh, to uh, instead of the uh, uh, muscle patch like this and finish. This is the first version of the model. This that's a finish, and this is the second version that use a tube. So expose a tube uh, by drilling and make a, a hole on the tube. So the breathing is coming from the uh, tube. So like this, we use a pump. The uh, pressure is the same as a, a normal human human. That's why I keep keep breathing like this. So by the thick suction and make a control the breathing like this after that so this is the option just uh, make a use a clip to control the uh, breathing point like this so control the breathing just to skip and use a clip to, to make a hemostasis in the uh, breathing point like this so we developed a two version of the uh, training model. So my conclusion is the pre uh, preparation and training is important in the devastic situation. Yeah, thank you. Very good, Jun. Uh, anyone has a comment about, I mean, there are other models out there. Zada has done this with Cadaver where he has pumps as well. Yeah. And uh, you can try with a similar anatomy. The problem is like, you gotta use Cadaver. I think Jun's model uh, the advantage is that you can create as many as this as you want, and the pump is artificial, so you can practice. And uh, we actually have that that in our course here uh, that we that we uh, have the people during their course rotating in the station to control the carotid with the model as well. So I think we actually checked the before and after, and the people do better when they practice. Like after practicing a few times, they 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 are able to control in a faster fashion. Uh, using the model. So I think it's really like uh, important. Omar, if you want to just finalize with your case and then uh, we're getting to the hour here. Yeah, I will. Um, oh, Natalia, I think I need permission. 
Natalia, I think he uh, reinitiated. So if you don't mind, uh, give him permission again. One question. Where, where can I get the muscle patches during the endoscopic skull surgeries? And when we experience the, this the accident? Abdominal yeah, that's, muscles? That's a very good question. Uh, to say, we used to have uh, just the belly prep and we had a situation where we couldn't find fat on the erectus abdominalis on this old lady. So then we, because it is a trophic, I don't think she did sit-ups. So then uh, uh, we've been prepping the quadriceps because it's the easiest way to go there. Some people talk about taking the tongue, uh, but I think that's uh, too much. Like, a, you know, uh, I don't like that idea. Uh, so don't we, take the tongue, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're pre we, we prep the, the quadriceps. The quadriceps works very well. Uh, other option is uh, temporalis because you're right there. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's see, uh, Omar. Let's, uh, if you don't mind going... Um, uh, summarize yeah. your case, that'll be great. I'll, I'll, I'll do very quickly. So yeah, this is different than the case I prepared, but I thought it would be interesting just to, as a last case on different different vascular topics. So, you know, this is a skull basement angioma uh, as opposed to uh, one that's approached openly as opposed to transphenoidally. But I was going to talk about a, vas a venous complication because we talked a lot about an arterial complication. And, and this one um, has been progressing radiographically, getting bigger, which is an indication for surgery. It involves a tentorium. And the question is always, is the transverse sinus compressed or is it actually involved? And I wanted to show uh, a technique that we, we use called the dynamic CT angiogram. I don't know how um, available these are, but they obtain um, on the bottom right or here, obtain a regular CT angiogram and then they uh, acquire images at different phases. And then we do a reconstruction. So you end up with information that's very similar, not, not exactly identical, but very similar with temporal resolution that you would get, for example, from a, a, a catheter angiogram without the invasive nature. So we've been employing this uh, imaging technique on a regular basis for all different types of skull based pathology. And, and here, this is recreating a left-sided injection. And you can see where the transverse sinus is attenuated um, and what I wanted to highlight in, in this particular case is this is also where the left side of the dominant labae is inserting into the transverse sigmoid junction. So um, the, the point I was going to make is, one, the amount of information that you can get from a dynamic imaging technique, um, and two, in terms of um, what happened in this particular case, which is uh, I thought I was going to be able to dissect it off the transverse uh, sinus wall, uh, but instead, I had injury to the wall, which I reconstructed with gel foam and glue, which works really well for the hemostasis. Uh, unfortunately, she ended up with labay distribution, venous congestion, which fortunately got, got better uh, and largely has resolved. But, but I wanted to just at least mention a, a, venous, a venous case after all the arterial discussion. Do you have the CT post-op like with the congestion? Uh... Uh, I don't have it on this system, no, but it, oh, it just okay. had, you know, the usual hypo, hypo density in that area. Which is important to remember those as well. Right. Okay, well, uh, let me uh, share my last, uh, let me share the last picture here. I want to just finish with this uh, uh, slide here for the carotid, because I think it's important. Uh, some Just some couple of things to remind everybody and in, in people watching. I think we talk about the uh, keeping a visualization and using a cotinoid first. I think when you have a carotid rupture, you can be open or uh, endonasal. Muscle from all the studies is the summary that works well. Of course, if the transaction is side to side, that muscle is not going to work. Then you have to clip, you have to figure out some other way to control. Jun's Muto uh, uh, method to practice, I think, is excellent. A couple of things like remember, not ENTs usually try to do hypotension in these cases, but we want to keep perfusion. So we we need to think on the brain. If you have SSAPs, keep going. Try, try to keep a high middle arterial pressure there. One thing that uh, the main reason I brought this slide is to remind everybody we didn't talk about this, but every time you get a rupture on the carotid, you should ask for heparin. We do like 5,000 of heparin IV right, right there because that decreases the chance of those embolic events that we saw some cases with those 
um, and of course, organize everybody, get blood and get the uh, Angel Suite ready to go. Some of you guys have Angel Suite at the same place there. It's not the case for most, uh, I think, uh, places. Uh, usually, usually it's uh, you have to stabilize the patient and transfer to the Angel Suite. So I just want to finish with those thoughts. And um, I don't know if anybody has a final um, a thought about these are devastating cases. We can have a full session about how you talk to the family and how you manage, you know, keeping the patient sedated. And uh, those are actually the, the parts that they're hard. I particularly had uh, had to cancel a trip with uh, after a carotid rupture because I, I didn't think I, I could just leave after, yeah. you know, you give news to the family. I would just... Uh, we just uh, stroke the patient's brain of your family member. And and by the way, tomorrow I'm going on this trip. Oh. And it just doesn't work that way. So, you know, we, we suffer with the families. We don't sleep. And that's another another part of the uh, difficulties of doing what we do. But so, you mentioned the family. That's a key word. It's like be honest, direct, and sincere, but not self-blaming in front of the family. Just, you know, say, I mean, we were trying our best and this is a complication that's happened and yeah. we're dealing with it but don't don't try to say well i mean it's not my fault or like right no, no yeah. denial but no self-blame <laughs> yeah but but at the same time we don't want to disappear and then because sometimes no. our response is like i want to just go and like Ricky corral says i want to go home and be in fetal position under the blank the blankets <laughs> you know uh, <laughs> That we want to do that, but that doesn't doesn't solve. We got to be present, try to do the best because complication uh, leads to complication and things can just get aggravated. So I don't know if anyone has uh, anything else. Uh, I think we are past the hour a little bit. So uh, I think with this, we should uh, finalize. And thank you so much for your participation. We'll put all this very important information on YouTube and uh, hopefully to help uh, people around the world as well. Thanks so That's much. Great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.